But I do think based on technologies and uh, the rate at which knowledge is advancing, that we may be able um, to cure addiction. Hi, everybody. My name is Doug Barr, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the St. Helena Forum for Innovation and Creativity. The Forum is an educational nonprofit with a mission to inform, entertain, and we hope inspire by presenting artistic performances and exchanges of creative and innovative thinking on a wide variety of humanities-based subjects. More than 46 million people in the United States have had at least one substance use disorder and only 6.3% have received treatment. Moreover, people who use drugs are facing an increasingly dangerous drug supply, now often tainted with fentanyl. Approximately 107,000 people died of drug overdose in 2021, and 37% of those deaths involved simultaneous exposure to both opioid and stimulant drugs. Unequivocally, drug use and addiction represent a public health crisis characterized by high social, emotional, and financial cost to families and to communities and to society. Our guest is on the front line of the battle against addiction, and I am pleased to say she is here today to tell us about recent breakthroughs that could lead to more effective prevention and treatment strategies for multiple substance use disorders. Dr. Nora Volkov is director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the National Institute of Health. The National Institute of Drug Abuse is the world's largest funder of scientific research on health aspects of drug use and addiction. As a research psychiatrist, Dr. Volkov pioneered the use of brain imaging to investigate how substance use affects brain functions. Her studies have documented how changes in the dopamine system affect the functions of brain regions involved in reward and self-control in addiction. She's also made important contributions to the neurobiology of obesity, ADHD, and aging. Dr. Volkov was born in Mexico and earned her medical degree from the National University. Her psychiatric residency was at New York University, where she earned a Laughlin Fellowship from the American College of Psychiatrists as one of the 10 outstanding psychiatric residents in the entire United States. Much of her professional career was spent at the Department of Energy's Brookhaven National Laboratory, where she held several leadership positions, including Director of Nuclear Medicine, Chairman of the Medical Department, and Associate Laboratory Director for Life Sciences. Dr. Volkov is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the Association of American Physicians. She received uh, the International Prize from the French Institute of Health and Medical Research for her pioneering work in brain imaging and addiction science, and she was also awarded the Carnegie Prize in Mind and Brain Sciences from Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Volkov was named one of Time Magazine's top 100 people who shape our world and one of Fortune Magazine's 34 leaders who are changing healthcare. We have asked our friend Dr. Elizabeth Bates Fried to join Dr. Volkov in a conversation. Betsy Bates Fried, as we know her, is a clinical psychologist and medical journalist with a special interest in the intersection between physical illness and emotional well being. Born and raised in Colorado, she graduated from Denison University with a degree in writing. She then worked for more than 25 years as a daily newspaper reporter and editor. Betsy was also a contributor to numerous books on health and wellness. She was the medical correspondent and bureau chief for the International Medical News Group. Betsy's also written for independent publications for physicians, including clinical psychiatry news, pediatric news, and internal medical news. In a midlife career shift, Betsy earned her master's and doctorate degrees in clinical psychology from Antioch University. Her clinical practice focuses on patients and families as they manage illnesses such as cancer, neuromuscular disease, and dementia. She also teaches psychology at the graduate level and is currently writing a book for therapists about working with families of dementia patients. And now, after that somewhat epic introduction, if everybody's ready, let's listen in on the conversation between Dr. Nora Volkov and Dr. Betsy Bates-Fried. 
So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Volkoff. It is so uh, special that we've been able to join with you today to talk about addiction for the St. Helena Same. Forum. Um, I wanted to begin by kind of asking for you to recount for us how your life work in the science of addiction reflects your family legacy and your values. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your passion for science and how that evolved from your childhood in Mexico City and the family values that were conveyed to you in that time? Yeah, no, I, I have to start by saying basically, first of all, thanks for having me here. But second, I mean, I, I, that, that whole issue starts with I'm a very, very curious person. I'm just and I'm a very obsessive and I want to understand things. And so uh, in that respect, if you sort of say, well, someone that is curious and wants to understand things and is obsessive, you see why a science is a major attractor. So to me, that was immediately part of my personality. The issue co uh, goes around in terms of how do you focus that drive towards curiosity and understanding. And that's what I would say having the uh, my family uh, background influenced me and and the emphasis that was given in by my parents, um, this is not unique to me, to all of my other three sisters, of uh, the responsibility that each one of us has of um, doing with our lives something that can help others. So it is not enough to just sort of contently and happily live your life. Uh, we were from a very early age um, enforced or educated or or spoken about how, how crucial it is to try to help others that may not have the same resources, capabilities. And two, we were also sensitized to um, paying attention to in, injustices and, and the vulnerable. So I think that those elements on my upbringing and issues that were so very relevant uh, when I was growing up, particularly uh, growing up in a country like Mexico, that where there's tremendous disparities between people that have resources and those that do not. Not that it's unique to Mexico, we also have it in this country, but growing up in a country that where people can die because of malnutrition, because they cannot afford to pay, to pay medications for um, antibiotics that are very, very low cost. So, so, so that, that actually sensitizes you. And, and I like uh, in terms of that, that aspect of being sensitive and uh, devoting my life to towards something that could help others. But I also was very much inclined um, to medicine. And, and the reason why is medicine obviously provides that ability to help others. I mean, it's sort of like to say, well, science is a career that leads you to actually, for someone with curiosity, there you have it. But medicine also gives you that opportunity. I think it's a privilege to be able to to, to do something that helps others is, is very reinforcing. I think that if we all are honest with ourselves and uh, how we feel when we help someone else, it is, uh, again, again uh, very, very rewarding. It feels very good to help someone else, and it feels really bad when you see someone else suffering. So medicine allows you to place yourself in a profession where you can do that, where you can use your what your knowledge, your education, your talent to help others. Right. Absolutely. I can totally see that. And I did a little bit of research on, on your sisters as well. It's quite a remarkable family. And um, I do think that it's interesting that Mexico, in, in addition to being a country of great disparities and great promise, really, but it was a refuge for your family, right? Yeah, no, and I think that that is an aspect, obviously, that influenced me, that my family, um, I mean, I guess certainly my father uh, survived because, um, I mean, the country Mexico embraced, I mean, my, my father being the grandson of Leon Trotsky and his um, father being sent into a concentration camp where he will later be killed and his mother who committed suicide, um, uh, was left an orphan, and he actually, therefore, his grandfather, Leon Trotsky, uh, took, uh, basically adopted him, and that's how he ended up in Mexico. But he ended up in Mexico because the only country that was wi willing to give political asylum to Trotsky was Mexico. I mean, even the other countries, even, 
in the United States, which where there was a, a big, big support of by 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 groups of people towards Trotsky and what he was trying to do, um, there was a lot of concern that antagonizing uh, Stalin would be coming at a very large cost to these countries, and that's that's what happened, and that's why Europe did not provide political asylum. That's why. Um, that actually my father, my grandfather had to leave the United States also, but Mexico did. And I think that that element of um, of support for political emigrants has been something that has existed in Mexico forever. And it's something that is is, is quite remarkable. And it, it also affected the, my mother's side of the family because Mexico gave political asylum to um, the children of the civil war in Spain when Franco took power. And that actually led my mother's family ultimately to emigrate into Mexico. So you have Mexico open policy for people seeking political asylum. On the one hand, on my father's family because they were being persecuted by Stalin. And on the other side, by my mother's family because they were being persecuted by by Frank uh, uh, Franco and his allies. So this is why I mean and when you when you live in this 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 background historical background and you realize that you are alive is not automatic you are alive because some people were willing to take stands and do things that others were not. But also it highlights that uh, we do have a responsibility to avoid this horrible mistakes that have been done make historically that had res- resulted in in the death of millions of people and continue to result in discrimination and disparities that cause the life of people. So that's why I would say where my b- background of coming from Mexico comes around. Yes, exactly. And and so it's it's so interesting. You grew up in this environment with these very clear, distinct values that were being instilled, I would imagine, not, not you know, just, you know, sort of up through osmosis as you all grew up. And you drifted towards science and with this curiosity. So then uh, I know that you were, you were headed for MIT and then something sort of distracted you or pulled you in another direction. Do you want to tell us about what that, that period of your life was like? Oh no, absolutely! I remember because I wanted, uh, I had be, uh, been approved for going to MIT, and I had a, a scholarship and all of those things to do a PhD. But I, um, I had nine months of uh, free time before I could go and start MIT, and so I convinced my father to support me doing voluntary work, and 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 just actually says, you know, I'm very interested. I read on Scientific American about this imaging technology, and it really wowed me, it obsessed me, that allow you for the first time to go inside a human brain and, and actually measure parameters that are reflecting of biochemical processes or how actually the brain is being activated. And at that time, this was not a given. It's actually, there was no, the only way that we had to try to monitor what was happening in your brain uh, was with CAT scans, which are structural, so it doesn't really tell you about uh, very much function, or EEG, which where you close, place the electrodes on the outside. So the and the EEGs that we had then were much more limited than what we have now. But still, now we can only get surface information, whereas this technology opened it up. And I had always been fascinated by, as a medical student, to me, uh, psychiatric diseases were the most challenging because it is, if you think about what makes us as individuals, as humans, it relies very much in our brains. I mean, we, of course, interpret signals from the rest of our body. It's crucial. But, but the way that we respond to the world, the world that we respond to our own organs itself and physiology is our brain. And so when you have a psychiatric disorder where you have someone suffering from psychosis where um, you're actually unable to differentiate when an image or a sound is coming from the outside versus something that is generated internally. And thinking about the significance of that, just just imagining what it would be if you lost that capability, which of course we give for granted, we don't even think about it. 
um, but it's not for granted. And there's actually, if the brain is not properly functioning and, and there are distortions on signaling patterns and connectivity, you can completely disrupt that ability to uh, recognize what is external from internal. You can also interfere with the capacity to properly think. And so, so that is why I was so attracted to psychiatric disorders as different. I was also attracted to neurological diseases, but neurological diseases in my brain, to a certain extent, were much easier to understand. I mean, when you could actually trace what the pathology of a particular presentation was, uh, say you have seizures, you can localize where the seizure is. Someone stops speaking after a stroke, you can localize which area of the brain it is. You have Parkinson's disease and you can localize that uh, which areas, which cells have died. That's very different from psychiatric diseases where you cannot localize them. And so that's what attracted me to, to very much to psychiatry and uh, medicine. And, and sort of, um, to me, it was sort of like a natural process. And within psychiatric diseases, it was, um, I mean, imaging became fundamental. So that's why I say to my father, okay, you know, give me that time. I want to learn about this technology. I'm fascinated from as a medical student, psychiatric diseases. And my father, who has always supported my scientific curiosity, says, yes, I'll, I'll back you up. So I took a plane. I go to New York. I mean, I really, I was staying at the YMC <laughs> and I basically <laughs> show up to NYU University. And I said, I'd like to actually speak with the chairman, the director of the program of psychiatry, which was where these imaging studies were taking place. And, um, and long and behold, the, the secretary said to me, do you have an appointment? And I said, no. And she says, who are you? And I said, well, I'm, I'm Nora Volk. I came from Mexico. And at that point, the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry is coming to his office. And here's the conversation. And he says, come, come, come into my office. And that's how it started. And from there, I, I got engaged. So I got so involved with, uh, with um, participating as a volunteer on these research projects in imaging that then I said to MIT, very embarrassing. I basically met them and said, I'm sorry, I'm not going to go to MIT. I'm going to stay instead at New York University and do a residency training in psychiatry. So that is the long story of how it happened. Yes, and, and it's such an interesting story. And then... It, it literally was the first window into, into addiction in such a way that we can understand that it, we now have scientific proof that this is not just, you know, sinful or something that is a moral value, um, that people are just not trying hard enough. And that's why they become alcoholic or they become an addict or they compulsively eat. Um, and so it's, to me, that's one of the most interesting things about this particular period of history that you have been at the forefront of it is it's that was the first glimpse. And now we have even more insight genetically into into this idea. Right. Oh, yeah. No. And it is it's, it's crucial. It just opened the door for a series of scientific questions to try to understand why um, when people become addicted, their behavior is so horrifically disrupted and, and, and in ways that are very, very difficult to understand if you yourself has never been addicted. Because So that was uh, being able not just to identify that the brain, there were changes in the brain, biochemical and functional, on people that were addicted, identified it, yes, as a disease, just like you have a myocardial infarct, you can see that the tissue is diseased. So by Imagine you saw it, but more importantly, I think, even more importantly than that was by enabling us to identify the particular uh, disruptions of serving the brain of people that were addicted, it gave us an insight about why the behavior is modified. So, which otherwise becomes impossible to understand, right? And sort of says, how come someone who takes that drug when they are addicted and they don't even feel it's pleasurable, nonetheless, is willing to basically do anything they can, risk everything in order to get another hit if they are not even enjoying it. So that, that paradox, which patients themselves ask themselves, well, I don't understand why. Um, I mean, typical, and I'm sort of typical, typical, is no longer pleasurable. I just cannot stop. So by understanding the neurocircuitry, the disruption in the brain of people that are addicted, you start to say, aha, 
that's why this person is unable to self-regulate and why they cannot inhibit these intense desires. And then that obviously opens up the door or the window, whatever you like, to then think about ways of treating it. So how do we buffer that dysfunction? How do we revert it? And, you know, for many, many years, I had been saying, okay, the effects of, of drugs on the brain are chronic and they are long lasting and they are uh, amplified by the, by, the, by the changes in behavior that then modifies the brain. So there's almost like a domino effect. So always, and, and our message has been, it's a chronic disease. You treat it like a chronic illness. And it's until recently that I have allowed myself to imagine that we may be able to cure it. And we may be able to cure it because we are advancing in our understanding of the key players in the process that is leading to some of these pathological behaviors. Um, and we are developing technologies that enable us to strengthen certain circuits and weaken others. So I do think, and I, I, mean, I don't want to just speak as a magical thinker, but I do think based on technologies and uh, the rate at which knowledge is advancing, that we may be able um, to cure addiction. Well, that is, ju that is just obviously, you know, revolutionary in, in its scope. And, and so tell us a little bit about how that has become possible. Um, I know that there have been some surprises that, that it once was thought that everything about addiction was really in kind of the limbic system of the brain. And then there have been some surprises that it's not, it's not as simple as it seemed, correct? Yeah, no, no, no. For many years, the whole field was saying, oh, people are addicted because they are much more sensitive to the rewarding effects of drugs. And then we were doing the studies to see if effectively the neurochemical systems that signal rewarding the brain were more, uh, more sensitive in people that were addicted, which they would give a very simple answer why people, uh, some people are more likely to become addicted uh, than others. And what we found was exactly the opposite. Number one, they were much less sensitive. And now we recognize that, that if you have an individual that has lower sensitivity to rewards in general, which in, in basically one of the factors that underlies that decrease in reward sensitivity is that the function of their dopaminergic limbic system is basically um, disrupted. They have like, there are people that are taller or shorter, or we have some people with higher high rates or lower rates. We have some people with more or less active dopamine system. So if you happen to be someone with a lower dopamine signaling system, that that could put you at risk. So yes, to start with, the whole contention about why people were becoming addicted was wrong and exactly in the opposite direction. But it also became clear that it's not just sufficient to have this disrupted sensitivity of the dopamine system and rewards, but there is also involvement on self-regulation and in decision-making and in appraisal of uh, what are our alternatives. And so when someone becomes addicted, they basically become fixated. There's no competition of any other reward. The only thing that drives the motivation is taking the drug. Now, we all in our everyday life are expe uh, exposed to rewards and we need to make decisions of if he, what we do or not and based on our past experiences, based on our ability to predict the future and say, well, this costs me more in the long range. And based on that, we do a decision. That requires the function of this prefrontal cortex. And in, the, in addiction, uh, drugs actually um, damage the function of the prefrontal cortex, repeated drug exposures. Um, particularly, actually, if you start taking drugs very early on, uh, like in adolescence, uh, studies have shown that they also interfere with the development of the prefrontal cortex, which then leads us to understand why people that take drugs early are more vulnerable to addiction later on. But it is, uh, you were bringing it very from the beginning. I mean, we do know that there are differences in genetics in terms of the genes are involved in the development of the prefrontal cortex. So it sounds like what you're telling us is that now you have evidence within the brain on a number of different levels that demonstrate that the things that families can't understand and friends can't understand that a person's goals and motivations and the choices that they're making is actually impacted 
by things happening in the brain, not just in their sort of free will. Yes, and I, I smile about it because, I mean, obviously we always um, have this construct of free will and the notion that we're making decisions of what we want to do. And, and of course, we do have free will, but we also have to recognize that there are limitations in terms of certain areas that we don't have um, free will to overcome them. And I think this is this is what uh, leads you to give us an understanding of addiction. Say, Say, for example, that I have the free will and I'm going to say I'm going to stop breathing. And while I may be able to stop breathing for 60 seconds and I'm, if I'm very good for 120 seconds, that's it. No matter how much I want, I will breathe. And I say so another example is in terms of when you if you haven't had water for a long period of the time and you are dehydrated. I mean, the intensity of drinking is so gigantic that. Even if you have contaminated water in front of you and you know you're going to get sick from it, you are going to drink it. And so you lose that that uh, concept of I am going to control. I decide I don't want to breathe. I don't want to drink this contaminated water. Um, the drive, the intensity of the need will actually determine whether you are successful or not. And, and this is, in terms of addiction, what happens. You've generated in the brain a physiological change in the way that you when you become addicted process the need for the drug that is akin exactly to the need for air for breathing or the need for water where you are drinking this is not something that happens in a person that's not addicted i basically uh, i don't have that need for the drug at all but drugs in people that are vulnerable have the capacity to generate that artificial state of deprivation that is instinctually perceived as something that is needed for survival. And that's why the, the urges are so, so intense. And, and yes, uh, through research, we have come to realize um, that this, why this is happening and what are the systems that are implicated and importantly, what are strategies that we can do to try to uh, help individuals um, who are unable to, to basically stop these very strong, strong urges and to prevent them to be under those uh, situations? And are there are you, are you finding that there are commonalities and differences depending on the substance or the or the uh, the addiction where there might not even be a drug or alcohol type of a thing. Are there commonalities in the brain, um, whether it's like compulsive shopping or whether it's uh, heroin or whether it's alcohol? Yes, absolutely. Yes. And I think that this is something I have been um, very interested for at least three decades on my life as a researcher and now basically too, uh, in terms of its implications for uh, developing treatments for addiction. I wanted to see if this uh, neurocircuitry that is disrupted that leads you to the loss of control uh, over your behavior and the intense, intense desire for the drug was the same one that is implicated in people that have behavioral compulsive actions that can be very, very damaging. And so the behavioral compulsive action that um, basically me and my group has been looking at is uh, morbid obesity. And, and it is, um, and so we've been using that as a model to try to compare similarities and differences between people that are addicted to a wide variety of drugs, which have the, a common neurocircuitry, whether it's cocaine, heroin, nicotine, uh, cannabis, or, or marijuana, marijuana, I'm sorry, marijuana, cannabis, same, but, uh, or alcohol. But the, um, that same neurocircuitry is actually implicated in in, behave, in the uh, morbid obesity. Other researchers have started to actually have evaluated other addictive behavioral disorders like uh, sex or gambling. There's been now more recently interest on, interest on, on investigating uh, whether uh, what is the neurocircuitry that is disrupted in people that have basically addiction to the internet and to social media. And uh, there are absolutely commonalities but I do want to emphasize that, that there are also differences. And this is important to consider, too, because overall, and I think this is also what the genetic data is showing us, the, the main factor that is driving vulnerability, genetic vulnerability for addiction, is a common 
vulnerability factions for addictions, not one for specific substance or the other. Most of the variance from genetics is imprinting on you a vulnerability for addictiveness. And then there are, but there are also specific genes that confer you vulnerability to a particular drug. So you have a general addiction genetic vulnerability, and then why do you go to one drug versus the other? Number one, if you do have the gene that makes you more vulnerable to say opioids or nicotine or alcohol, then those are going to be the ones that you gravitate towards. Um, but also uh, considering that if you don't have them, a lot of your vulnerability is going to be determined by what you have in the environment. So if you don't have access to uh, fentanyl, we didn't have access to fentanyl in the past, so no one was addicted to fentanyl. Now that fentanyl is widely accessible, we have all of these Americans becoming addicted to fentanyl. So you have the sense of your uh, where you end up taking as a drug is dependent on genetic factors, but also on environmental factors. And as I think about it in terms of like behavioral addictions, which is what you were asking me, it's also clear that in our society, we are surrounded by incredibly appetitive looking uh, stimuli. I mean, yeah, let's speak about food and how you constantly, and I've discussed this at length. I mean, you have to constantly be in sort of attentive so that you can inhibit before you are exposed to these very, very appealing things that are full of calories and sugar and fat and salt. And, and I, I basically, my, my strategy at this point is I don't even go there. I don't allow myself to even try them because they are so powerful reinforcers. So to the extent that we have these reinforcers as a society, so we, we basically maximize our ability to make extremely appealing, appealing food, uh, the way that sexual stimuli, for example, are portrayed and and, and engaging people into it is also expanded. I, I wonder, uh, for example, in gambling, I mean, now that gambling, you can gamble on your cell phone. I mean, that is another reinforcer. We, I suspect that we're going to see a significant increase on gambling use disorder. So what is available is an extremely important factors that determine from your vulnerability where you will end up into. Right, I, I mean, I think that's really critical. and and worth discussing because, uh, you know, obviously 20 years ago when you were starting to, to take over NIDA, things were different. You know, um, the types of addictions that, that were impacting people were different and the overdose rates and the death rates were very different because, you know, they weren't as, they weren't as lethal as the things that people are using now. So that, you know, I was looking, I, I think it's like an increase of 700%, you know, over the last 25 years in, in overdose deaths. And now suddenly the country is very, very engaged and concerned. Um, and yet what you're suggesting is that that environment has changed to lend itself to this terrible crisis, but also the genes were always there. The genes were always there, and it just mattered how they were going to play out. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, no, the genes have always been there, and it's basically what you get exposed to. But I do want to make a point that when I came to NIDA, I mean, we're seeing right now more than 108,000 people dying from overdoses. But when I came to NIDA, there were more than 400,000 people dying from uh, nicotine-related diseases, and more than 100,000 people dying from alcohol. So it's not that it's, it's all of a sudden we didn't have this problem. It was very, very clear and, and devastating. And so um, the what has brought it to focus is that um, the overdose deaths, I mean, people that are now dying are dying very, very fast. So if you die from tobacco, it may take 20 years to kill you, 30 years to kill you. With an overdose, you can die overnight with the first exposure from, from this fentanyl pill. So for the focus is like when, I mean, we have had infections all along, but when COVID comes around, that all of a sudden things move very rapidly, there's a lot of attention. That doesn't mean we did not have uh, epidemics uh, before, yes, and we have, and we have the influenza and we haven't solved it. But when something new emerges that actually adds into already very, very high 
rates of mortality that were associated with with rock taking which is as a society don't want to enforce it because there's a lot of revenue that is dependent on these other practices. I mean, people make a lot of money selling alcohol. They are making a lot of money selling tobacco. And and so those issues basically influence a society and structure it in a way that they make this more or less available. Now we have these illicit um, drugs that um, are manufactured synthetically, extraordinary potent, and very, very little. So it's not it's not a new phenomenon. And, um, and in the process, we've learned a lot of things. But what is unfortunate is that even though we have learned that, yes, uh, drugs uh, can create havoc, we still don't put the emphasis that they deserve as it relates to putting the resources to support their uh, screening and prevention and treatment in healthcare systems nor do we address at the very essence what are the factors that are making some people more vulnerable than others, many of which really depend on issues that are social determinants of health. The people that are most vulnerable for um, substance use disorder are people from low income that have less opportunities uh, in professionally, educationally, the ones that are most more vulnerable. And I think that that element of of social inequity is a major contributor to to the tremendous disparities in deaths from from drug use. That must be so frustrating for you because there are there's only so much you can do as a scientist, and it's been amazing. And the scientists who are working with you, the things that are coming out of your office are amazing. But it really does some of it is is very social and very economic. And, um, and I, you know, I'm just commenting that that must be very hard. Um, I guess we would turn to what, what science is pointing to. If you can tell us a little bit about some of the, some of the new approaches for treatments and, and for the idea of maybe prevention. Yeah, no, and I'm going to jump first in prevention so that the narrative follow. I mean, one of some of the most exciting things that we currently have is we launched a very ambitious study in 2015 where we're following 12,000 children as they transition into young adulthood, periodically monitoring them for everything we can, including how their brain is developing, their behaviors, emergence of psychiatric symptoms, social use of social media. And what these, um, these studies are starting to actually document is provide the evidence about how adverse social environments like poverty, like social deprivation, like neighborhood uh, quality, all of them influence the developmental trajectories of the brain. And they are identifying, for example, what areas of the brain may be more sensitive than others to these adverse events. And, and they're also how do genes actually translate into your sensitivity of these adverse events. So there, so we know there are people that are very resilient and even if you put them in very adverse events. So this is important because as we think forward into prevention, one of the key uh, areas is how do we determine uh, who is at higher risk so that we can intervene and so that we can protect that person from going into uh, further um, adverse outcomes from drug taking or mental illness. The other one is uh, this too crucial, how, what type of policies as a society we can institute that can minimize these negative effects of uh, social determinants of health. And there is, I mean, the data is starting to come out, identifying, yes, there are, there are policies that can make a big difference. So that's one. For the side of treatment, I think that um, there are many things that have me very, very excited and that actually led me to the notion that we one day we may be able to cure addiction. And that is, uh, on the one hand, recognizing um, by understanding in greater depth the neurocircuitry behind addiction and how these different elements of these circuitries actually engage in what aspects of the behavior and how much they differ from one person to the other, we can then target personalized interventions uh, using tools like neuromodulation. And that's 
things like transcranial magnetic stimulation or electrical stimulation that allow you to send pulses that can strengthen or inhibit uh, certain areas and circuits. And more recently, actually, there is a new technology that is also a neuromodulation technology, but instead of using electrical or magnetic waves, uses ultrasound. And the advantage of the ultrasound is it can permeate tissue, so you can be so much more precise and go in depth into some of the key nodes in this neurocircuitry. And the preliminary results are, are look very, very exciting. So that's from the perspective of neuromodulation. But there's also research going on to try to understand actually what are the molecular mechanisms that lead to the strengthening of the reinforcing value of a drug. What happens? How does that happen? And we do know that it is you know, basically gives priority to the communication between two neurons so that that gets strengthened. So when there is a stimulus, the probability that it goes through that, it's enhanced. And it's exactly the same molecular mechanisms that we use when we learn. When we learn, we strengthen connections that then enable us to actually learn activities and how to do them automatically without thinking. So the issue is how can we now, we often understand who those molecular players are, can we do uh, drugs, for example, that can accelerate the generation of those memories? Can we uh, strategize it so that if I can give you a cognitive therapeutic intervention that it's aim again to strengthen and learn, teach you to learn new skills, if I give you a drug that can strengthen that memory process, can I accelerate uh, your ability to do so? And I can also enhance that the, the duration of that strengthening. And that's where you have um, new therapeutics, like there's a lot of interest in, in the research area of psychedelic drugs because they are considered in animal models. They have shown the ability to be able to enhance those molecular processes are necessary for learning. So you increase the density, the connections in between neurons by giving them. And so if you then you start to build up, right? So if we understand the neurocircuitry uh, very precisely and identify which areas are key for the manifestation of the disease, and then I want to ablate them, which for which you could actually do inhibition through neuromodulation, or you can strengthen others to counteract them, which you can enhance with things like psychedelics. You can start to see why the notion of eventually coming up with cures is, is feasible. And, and it's, it's to me, I, you know, I always sort of says, no, 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 no. I, I'm not a magical thinker. But then in, I think it was around 2005, there was a paper where it actually showed that people that had strokes in a very specific area of the brain, the insula, actually forgot to smoke. They, they stopped smoking from one day to the next, and they were cured from their smoking. And that led researchers to identify and say, well, why the insula? And of course, now we know so much more about the insula, and it's a key region in many of these networks. So the, that aspect of understanding the possibility that someone because of an area, in this case, we're not going to create these lesions. There are ways that we can be much more precise without damaging tissue that, that, is, that actually is important to keep alive. We can do it very precisely. Then that's, that's why I, I basically do believe that with tools and knowledge, we can target those interventions to help people get cured at one day. I mean, not now yet, but I do think it's possible. Right. And that's just remarkable. And, and it sounds like it could be quite individualized um, because of all these new techniques that there are that you could, it might not be the same for one person as the next, right? Absolutely. No. And that's why we all speak in medicine. Let's do personalized medicine. And you in cancer, they are the ones that are most advanced. You take the tumor and look what are the mutations and then you target the drops to those mutations. In the brain, there's nothing that tells us why can we not do exactly the same? Let's look at the mutations of the brain. But if you want to use that term, it's not mutations, but the alterations on the neurocircuitry uh, so that we can target it that way. So absolutely, I think that this is uh, 
in many ways a non-brainer from the perspective of hypothesizing where things are going to go. The, the challenge is, of course, how to do it. No, not to say that it is valuable or not. It's, of course, what you we, we are aiming for. Right, right. That's just amazing and remarkable. And on another on another level, the idea of prevention. Um, I was just really interested in a study that your office had shared with me about uh, looking at a million people and their genetic genetic fingerprints, essentially, and then looking at tying those to certain types of addictions, uh, even in children who had family histories of, of addiction, uh, they were too young, you know, to be exposed. Is there what, I mean, I, it seems like the possibilities of that are just, you know, amazing. And I, and I just wondered where your thoughts go with what we're finding out genetically about, would there ever be a way, can you imagine, of being able to turn off genes in a child so that that child would not would not become addicted or not be at ha such a high risk? Well, I think that that is, um, I mean, in, 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 uh, in some of the neurodegenerative diseases or the mutations that occur in children that result in severe phenotypes, that's very likely to happen. But what, what we know in the genes that are associated with addiction, first of all, is that the, the effect of any one single gene, except for alcohol, where you have genes that protect you because you don't metabolize alcohol properly is very, very small. So it's from there saying, okay, um, you modify that gene, you're going to protect the person. That's very unlikely to be the case. And as we were discussing before, what this study shows is that it is polygenic scores that actually are accounting for most of the variance. So they may say uh, able to explain 6% or 7%, but it's multiple genes. It's you weigh them, so it's not one gene that drives them. Uh, by a single gene, is very, very small, very small. So that's why I say I don't see that that is uh, where I would basically bet. And also the other aspect about it, I mean, these genes, if they were so deleterious, uh, they would have disappeared. And yet we see addiction persistent throughout civilization. So these genes do have multiple effects and some of them may be very beneficial very important and so i think that that's why i would say that's not that's not where i would bet on and then there's a third element to it genes are fixed right you are born with your genes but your brain evolves and so you may have the gene now and you will not become addicted until 10 15 years when you have an exposure that leads you to then change your behavior. So the aspect of uh, identifying environmental factors that make someone more vulnerable is, uh, is crucial and is where we have the greater ability to modify than do prevention. I do think that where genetics can help us enormously is to guide us into terms of potential treatments. So for example, with with genes, uh, one of the, I think, very, very notable findings on genetics has been identification of a gene uh, that makes you vulnerable for nicotine addiction. And this gene, uh, the alpha-5 nicotinic receptor, is located in an area of the brain that is responsible for activating. When it activates, it makes us feel miserable. So just like you have areas of the brain that makes you feel good, there are areas that make you feel miserable. And it is important because in certain circumstances, that emotional state is going to guide you to behave in different ways. And that area is loaded uh, specifically with this, this receptor. And, and this, uh, which is basically encoded by the genes that make you vulnerable. And so that has led researchers to look at uh, molecules that can interfere with the signaling in this uh, abenular pathway that drives smoking behaviors, that makes you much more vulnerable when you activate this uh, abenular pathway in general, whether it is because more likely to be activated, you have the gene, but if you are in a very stressful condition, it's going to get activated. So understanding in, in, that, in that context we can get a much better realistic 
um, idea of why this genetic research is so very important, but also not as simple as, okay, we're going to manipulate the gene. Right, right. That makes total sense. It's, it sounds, it, it sounds obviously some of these things are much more complex than they might appear. And you have to be so careful with anything like psychedelics or with brain stimulation or with genetics that, you know, I mean, you don't want unintended consequences, obviously. Um, so I, I want to now just open it up to you. Anything else that I, I, your agency is doing so many things and you are reaching out uh, to thought leaders and, and, you know, financial sources and politicians uh, trying to identify all these different multifactorial ways that we can address the issue of addiction. Is it, what would you like the, the average person who's viewing our, our program to know that they might not know now about addiction? You know, do you, do you have any messages for them or um, suggestions or hope? How, how, how would you characterize that? Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely for hope, by all means. I think that the science, our understanding of things is actually advancing at such such gigantic paces. And I do think that what we have lived through the COVID pandemic has enabled us to see the possibility of developing solutions relatively rapidly and putting the resources in a society that are necessary um, to provide those, those treatments. So I think to me, that is a very important lesson learned from the COVID pandemic. While at the same time, an important lesson learned from the COVID pandemic is how misinformation can basically create havoc and put people at a tremendous risk of um, of ill effects because of uh, the lack of understanding or the, of the manipulation of information. So yes, science is extraordinary in its ability to actually come up with solutions but also um, science, if not implemented at the population level, generates basically no real advances. So we have to create equitable systems. And then the one that I just mentioned, we have to make that science accessible and open so it is not manipulated and distorted. Because I think that that's what is going to lead us to much better prevention and much better treatment interventions. And that, that will require that we address social determinants of health, because otherwise we're going to have people that are very vulnerable trying to escape their circumstances by taking drugs. There's no way out. I mean, it is the way that our brain is hardwired. So we need to generate the equitable systems. Wow. And so just cultivate the environment that offers alternatives before, before this takes hold of a person's life. Yeah. Yeah. Give them a chance, give them opportunities. Excellent. I cannot thank you enough. This has just been so, so informative and so uh, amazing, sort of mind expanding about what the possibilities are. And uh, we are so very grateful for you. Thank you. Thanks for your interest. Take care. Bye-bye. Wow, what a fascinating and important conversation. Thanks to both Dr. Volkov and Dr. Bates Fried for being with us today at the forum. We have some exciting new programming lined up and we hope to see you all back with us here in about a month at the St. Helena Forum for Innovation and Creativity. Before we go though, we'd like to thank the following people whose generosity makes the forum possible. 